Thank you all for joining today. We'll be starting momentarily. And good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Global Data Systems webinar on how to enhance data security in a multi-location environment. My name is Jamie Gidry, and I am Marketing and Communications here at Global Data Systems, and I'll be providing some introductions as well as some housekeeping items before handing it off to Robert Gidry and Tracy Webb. So before we get started, we want to know we respect your time and we will, we will run more than 55 minutes. This is an interactive webinar, so we encourage questions. And this webinar will be recorded, so you will receive a copy in the next couple of days. And at the end, we will have a post survey where you can receive an e-card from Walmart. So now I would like to introduce our speakers to you, Robert Gidry and Tracy Webb. Robert, will you now please introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, just a brief introduction for myself. I'm Robert Gidry. I'm the Chief Technology Officer over here at Global Data Systems. Um, a little over 30 years in the IT industry, I've been at Global Data Systems for a little over uh, 21 years. Um, numerous certifications, probably the most notable one, uh, the CCIE certification. Um, I was also in the Air Force for almost 10 years. Um, calibration repair of test equipment programming of automated test stations uh my role today i'm responsible for the uh design delivery and installation of uh, all the gds uh, products and services thank you jamie thank you robert and now we have tracy webb tracy would you like to introduce yourself uh good morning everyone my name is tracy webb um i've got a little over 25 years in communications and cybersecurity and it um, I started my career out in the United States Navy, uh, where I performed um, encrypted intelligence and communications uh, for Naval Special Operations. Um, much like Robert, I have numerous uh, certifications I've gathered over the years. The one I'm most uh, proud of is my certification as a Chief Information Security Officer. Um, and now I work for GDS and help them strategize and handle their uh, security operations for GDS and our clients. Thank you, Tracy. So, uh, <clears throat> so some of the things we're going to talk about today. So um, this is all about how we're using um, SD-WAN technology to um, allow for the connectivity across multiple locations. But more importantly, we also want to make sure that it is secure communication. So things we're going to talk about today is how do we uh, take a look at the uptime and availability of your applications, um, why we do that, how we do that. We're going to talk about the visibility that we're going to gain within this architecture and what can we do with that visibility. And then we're going to move away from a little bit of the technical piece and we're going to talk about uh, business operations, some of the back office functions and stuff. A lot of people don't really think about the technology or they only think about the technology. They kind of miss some of the back office functions. So we want to bring that uh, forward. And then we'll have a Q&A session toward the end. So as Jamie mentioned, this is going to be interactive. So we're going to start off by uh, our first poll. Uh, one of the things we really want to take a look at is really how many uh, locations does your organization have? And uh, while you guys are filling that out, uh, Tracy, let's uh, like to ask you kind of a, a couple of questions. So uh, we, we've seen the architectures changing, how people are, uh, are working today, different offices and so forth. And with security being foremost in most people's mind, I, I've got to believe that this change in the landscape is going to you know, change some of the security postures or security threats. Um, you have some thoughts on, on how that's changing? What are the risks that are being uh, presented today? Um, in this, uh, you know, growing technological age and uh, with the increase in need for remote offices and remote users and that connectivity, um, there's, there's several different attack vectors or threat vectors that um, are kind of unfolding uh, and becoming more prevalent. Um, some of those include unsecure access to corporate data, um, uh, internet domain access uh, to malicious domains, um, um, unsecure uh, or bringing your own uh, devices or utilizing your own devices in performing your job functions, just to name a few. Thank you, Tracy. So we've got some uh, uh, responses to our polls right now, and by far, it's kind of what we're expecting. What we see is a number of 
uh, organizations that are expanding. You know, we see their footprint growing. They're generally not siloed in a, in a single building any longer. So we can see over 55% of the people have more than 16 locations. So when we kind of take a look at, um, you know, what, what does that mean for us today? All right, so we're taking a look at how do we use, utilize technology, connect all these locations, and also connect them securely. So I want to talk about um, SD-WAN. It's surf, uh, Software Defined Wide Area Networking. So really, how is it different than things in the past? Well, in the past, we certainly were able to connect all of these locations. Um, so, I mean, it's going back, you know, a couple of decades. So there's not been a challenge in connecting them. The challenge in, has been in um, scaling them. So when you add to, needed to add one more location or a diverse uh, connectivity type and see what's going on in the network, that's, that's where it's been the challenge. So what you see in software-defined networking, we'll bring together the network, we'll bring in primary circuits, secondary circuits, and so forth. But more importantly, we'll have a centralized control point. That control point gives us the ability to configure the network and have common policies across the, the bases. And also, it's going to give us visibility. So as we transition over into you know, the next wave of this uptime and application visibility, the things that we want to talk about going forward is that, that visibility. What do we see and what, can we, um, uh, what business decisions can we make about uh, the, the data that we're seeing going across the network? So let's move forward one slide there. So what we end up doing at this point is having um, an architecture that has the ability to not only configure the network, but have the visibility see what's going on. How much bandwidth is, is being consumed? What applications are consuming those bandwidth? Um, are there uh, traffic going across the network that is counterproductive to the business operation. We're bringing in social media. Uh, we're bringing entertainment. All of these acts, um, applications that are now on the network, we need to see what's going on to make sure that they're not disruptive to the, um, to the business operations. So when we take a look at you know, the, what the network used to look like, again, we were able to build these architectures for, for a new number of years, right? We used uh, technologies such as frame relay, MPLS, things along those lines. Um, they were hard to build. You generally had to have a very seasoned um, network engineer to be able to build these networks. And uh, <clears throat> they were not very scalable. If, if you had to add another location, you had to order another MPLF circuit, for example, wait 60, 90, 120 days to get them connected. So all that changed when we it would bring in a software-defined wide area networking. We're now able to use multiple technologies to be able to connect the network. You can still use MPLS, but you also have the availability of broadband connections, which are uh, much more affordable, um, more ubiquitous. You can pretty much get them anywhere. And of course, you also have other technologies that you might not have thought about, um, uh, wireless technology. So what you see uh, in the 4G and certainly going into the 5G world where wireless could now be your last mile solution. Now you don't want to change your architecture, but you may want to introduce additional connectivity types and still all be managed by one umbrella. So one of the things that we're going to talk about next in, in our uh, upcoming poll is what are the concerns that you might have with uh, your workers going into remote offices? And while that <clears throat> poll is being run, Tracy, let's, uh, let's maybe expand the conversation a little bit more about those attack vectors. Um, I'm sure there's a couple more of them out there that you'd like to bring up. Well, in, in, the, in the case of <clears throat> specifically what you were just describing, um, there's really two uh, potential vulnerability areas um, from the headquarters or the, the corporate office to the uh, branch office or the remote user. Um, and those have to deal with exposure, um, uh, internet exposure, um, between, uh, using the connectivity between those two locations. That's a potential attack vector. And also um, applications in the public cloud or data centers can be at a highly exposed uh, level. So those two areas are primarily the two areas you want to pay the most attention to because you're talking about the bandwidth to make the connectivity and then 
the, the data or the applications in use to perform productive tasking for your company, those two areas you really want to center on trying to secure and pull out the vulnerability. Well, thank you for that, Tracy. And actually, it looks like the, the audience uh, concerns pretty much line up with uh, what you were just saying. 83% of our responders now you know, are saying that their biggest concern with workers in the remote offices is security. So um, it's, it's pretty interesting because as we've now <clears throat> have transitioned over into this software-defined wide area networking, it's going to give us the ability to connect all of those locations. But probably the most important thing, and I think the most important thing, maybe take a step back. <clears throat> the key thing we're, we're trying to accomplish here is providing secure connectivity, right? And what we're trying to do at this point is ensure the continuance of business operations. So there's a few things that kind of have to be, I guess, taken in, into balance and taken into account. So one, we're talking to look at how do we give the, the application and the business owners and so forth the ability to sustain their business. So we want to bring in multiple technology types, right? So we'll bring in maybe an MPLS circuit. You might bring in a broadband circuit. You can back that up with a, a wireless service like uh, LTE. So our goal at this point is to make sure that um, there's no disruptions in the network that can have a negative impact on, on business. So we've moved a lot of the applications that users would access for their business over into a headquarters location or they've moved over into um, a cloud data center. So it's extremely important for uh, our users to be able to access those applications. So the SD-WAN um, architecture allows us to uh, bring in multiple technology types and be able to detect failures and quickly switch them over to uh, a more appropriate connection type should you have a primary failure. Um, we also mentioned earlier about the ability to see what traffic is going across the network. And this is where I think security is really gonna come into play. Because not only can see how much bandwidth is being consumed, but we can see what applications are not prudent for uh, the business environment. And we can actually also start taking a look at uh, any malicious payloads that would be introduced into the network. And that's something that was not really apparent or available in previous architectures. You generally had a separate solution set to give you some visibility. You had a separate solution set that would give you some security. And rarely did any of them actually have a control mechanism to change the behavior of the network to account for those, uh, those disruptions. So this is some things that we're going to want to talk about as we move forward to start talking about some of these attack vectors. So attack vectors, right? So Tracy, you mentioned a little bit earlier about uh, some of the, um, I guess, call them new attack vectors as we've created this new technology that in introduces a higher continuity for business, but it comes with some risk, and we certainly want to be able to mitigate those risks. A remote office is connected to do the internet. You mentioned that one earlier this morning. Um, what thoughts or insights can you share with us about um, how to protect that, that uh, particular attack vector? Well, the, the good thing is that with uh, the framework we're discussing, it gives us um, a lot of visibility in the end of the traffic or the individual packet data that's passing across the network, right? So that gives us uh, an, uh, an ability with various technologies to inspect that traffic and identify if it's threatening ahead of time or if uh, by some accident or by some malicious attack, there's actually malicious traffic being generated and passed through the network. These two new technologies can identify that um, at various points in the network. Um, they, we can then use that threat intelligence to block or eradicate that threat and help the system learn how to go forward and be more preventative in even allowing that traffic to pass through the network end to end. All right, great. Now, not everybody is going to stay at a corporate office or maybe a remote office or a home office. We find that our users are extremely mobile. We've got a mobile workforce out there that might not necessarily be within that network that can have that protection. What can we do to protect those type of users that's in that mobile workforce? Well, the good thing about it is that these, these technologies uh, can be host-based uh, through roaming profiles on the user's actual machines, right? So wherever they go in the world, um, there's, these technologies will monitor for malware, 
or uh, threatening uh, traffic that comes into the machine or the host uh, machine. Machine. Um, it can be do DNS. Uh, um, I'm sorry, domain blocking or domain filtering to understand uh, that you know you may be trying to go to a website that is in fact malicious, or you're redirected to a website that might be malicious. So that technology and that security follows the user and the host regardless of the interconnect interconnectivity or the, uh, the internet connectivity that they may have or where they go in the world. So it sounds like even if our users are outside of the corporate network or one of our home offices or remote offices, if they're traveling, if they're in public Wi-Fi, uh, they're in hotels, they're in different locations that seems to be disconnected from the corporate, seems like we can still apply corporate policies to those users no matter where they are. That's correct. I mean, well, the good thing about the technology is that when we create these these roaming profiles or profiles for individual users from a corporate standpoint using you know best practices and policy that thing that those policies are embedded into the host through this connectivity and the various technologies we put on those machines so in effect regardless of where the user goes they're still following corporate best practices and security policies uh, to get their job done and can feel and can feel secure uh, in that they're doing it uh, protected and that the company itself is protected as well. Okay. Now, let's, let's talk about email for a second, right? So, um, so email is going to be one of the largest attack sectors out there. So I remember recent readings, more than 85% of the attacks um, are uh, executed through email. So we have people that are all over the place. How, how do we protect uh, their, the email component for our users, again, no matter where they're located? Well, the, the good thing about that um, is that we the email security architecture is designed in such a way that it's tied into the whole security ecosystem, right? So the policies that are created in your, uh, your corporate email security architecture handle that email, you know, coming into your corporate environment. Um, it, it filters it, 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 it applies policies and procedure, uh, best practices to it. Um, it's tied into overall threat intelligence with the other pieces of the security platform and that ecosystem. And so by the time that mail gets to you, it's been scrubbed, it's been looked at, it's been proven to be uh, with a high degree of confidence as being safe to be utilized. And um, the, the email architecture, as well as the rest of the security platform, uses that intelligence. So when malicious email does try to enter the network with malicious file hashes or email addresses or phishing type emails, um, it learns against that and, and we can apply um, a certain level of automation throughout the security architecture and especially the email architecture to prevent that from ever being a problem again. So what happens um, about email going out of the organization? Um, how, how are we protecting those emails, making sure that we ourselves are not the one that's uh, going to propagate the virus, or how do we protect ourselves against corporate data that's actually leaving the environment as well? Well, it's just a reverse model, essentially. So uh, as when email is created in the corporate environment and then chosen to be sent to other uh, clients or, or other users, um, the, the email architecture is built in such a way that with various technologies, that email can be verified against um, uh, being the domain itself being valid, that the, the records that are hosted for that email, uh, that email domain are verified to be true and non-malicious. So by the time the email leaves our environment or leaves the corporate environment and gets, gets to another person's desktop or email client, it's already been vetted as, as coming from an authorized source and verified as being clean and protected uh, to to the uh, to the rece receiver of that email. All right, great. So kind of, let's move forward just a little bit. Let's take a look at here's a, a time for another polling question right there. Um, start take a look at um, what are the current plans to implement any SD WAN uh, for for any of your locations. So Tracy, while that one's going on, let's let's talk about any of those additional attack vectors. You know, so I hear some additional threats that are coming in. Um, where, uh, you know, um, locally attached uh, devices like um, thumb drives, for example, you know, how do we protect ourselves from malicious data being posted on there? 
How do we um, take care of things like educating our users? Because a lot of this is about technology, but there's certainly a user aspect in there as well, too. Is there a couple more threats, uh, sectors that we want to chat about? Well, I think one of the ones that are, is obviously most prevalent right now is there's a whole lot of talk about malware, right? So uh, that's that, and that can be that can be introduced into uh, a corporate environment either via email or, like you said, either via you know uh, uh, USB drives and things like that that are are just you know infested with these kind of things. Um, uh, there's technologies out there now that uh, on the host machines that are tied back into the security e ecosystem that, you know, looks at these malicious malware file signatures and hashes and um, understands that it is, in fact, malicious. It can block or eradicate that and at the same time um, bounce that in threat intelligence off of the, the, uh, the threat intelligence cloud and it provide more um, content and artifacts to that overall uh, threat intelligence cloud so that all users utilizing that threat intelligence can become more hardened and more secure against those kind of threats. Oh, you know what? I did a faux pas there. I was on mute. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, tying it all together. So, um, so what we want to talk about right now is how do we create the big picture? How do we bring in the technology? How do we create the visibility? Uh, how do we create the security? So when we kind of tie it all together, there's some some um, some groupings of some technology that comes together that's really going to enhance our ability to to see what's going on. And of course, once we can see things, that, that's the predecessor, in order to be able to control something or manage something, you have to have visibility. So as we're bringing the architecture together and we now uh, are enabling the business and the uptime of the business, what can we do with that data that we're receiving? So Tracy, let's talk about this at, at the network layer, right? What is the network layer seeing? You talked about malware and stuff like that. You know, how, how does that come together? How does it come together in an ecosystem where one of the attack vectors can maybe witness something, but yet the other attack vectors benefit from that visibility? Uh, well, the, the, the idea of a cloud-based threat intelligence sharing model basically takes um, – takes on the form of it being the eyes and ears and um, and uh, the protection or the soldier in, in everybody's corporate environment, right? So what it does is sit there uh, almost globally and it receives and sends threat intelligence based on what's happening in individual corporate environments, right? So if there was an unfortunate event by a client down the road or another corporate uh, data center and they had some malicious uh, activity or or threat activity occur, a, a vulnerability was exploited or a breach of some kind happened. Um, that intelligence is shared with the cloud um, and those unique identifiers are added to that threat intelligence. And then it's passed back down to the various corporate security ecosystems to help them become more hardened and, and block against similar attacks or attack vectors or those, or those kinds of threats. Okay, so I'm going to kind of put together a little bit of a scenario and see if it kind of walks through. So let's say we have um, a threat that came in. Let's say it came in through email, and um, that um, that incident, it, it, it wasn't threatening in any way. It didn't expose itself. It just looked like normal traffic, and it kind of made it through to um, a user who might have turned around and forwarded it to three other users, right? So in a retrospective you know, system, uh, the email server would have also set that unknown payload and said, okay, can you tell me anything about this? And if it comes back to be 
uh, verified to be uh, a vulnerability or an attack, but not, I have this this email or this payload on you know four or five other systems. It sounds like the visibility that we have on those systems, you know, you know, that are protecting that attack vector, knows that it occurred, and it can turn around and, in retrospective um, um, viewpoint, eliminate that threat. Is, is that kind of what you were walking through there? That's correct. I mean, these, you know, you have to look at the, the, the security ecosystem and the various technologies, essentially like, like the human body, right? So um, there's, there's, there's eyes, there's hands, there's ears, there's smell, there's taste, right? So in, that, in the security environment, uh, regardless of the, the way that the threat or the potential threat or, or the bad actor tries to enter the network, what ends up happening is all those technologies are tied together, and they they utilize each other's threat intelligence to make assessments. And what, to your point, what would might seem like initially as a very um, unthreatening act um, can uh, slip through and begin to make uh, malicious changes to a host machine, file servers. Uh, you know, pick pick your your attack vector right there. Um, and what happens is when the system becomes knowledgeable, it passes on the various indicators of threat to the other pieces of the ecosystem, and then they begin to use that information to block files, to eradicate the threat itself, to, to even lock down accounts to prevent that, that, that threat from being uh, propagated throughout the, the network any further. So that's kind of within an organization. But now we can leverage the cloud to take a look at how do we expand that. So we don't actually have to be um, maybe say the, the the victim of an attack. We can our systems can be can leverage awareness throughout multiple organizations that are into that ecosystem. Correct? Can you explain that process a bit? Yeah, that's correct. Um, the, with the technology in place today and, and the cloud-based threat intelligence sharing, um, if for instance GDS would come up against what we in the industry might call uh, a zero day model of a virus or a malware, right? Um, as we struggle with getting that handled, getting it under control, getting it eradicated, um, what begins to happen is all the intelligence that we gather, the, the malicious file hash is completely unique um, to the world at that point. It truly is something that has not been seen. It's a variant of, of something else that's never been identified. As, as our ecosystem and our security tools learn to, to find and eradicate that, it passes that information up to the threat intelligence cloud, that way that other organizations are not faced with that zero day threat. There's intelligence, there's artifacts, there's hashes, there's various indicators uh, that are supplied to the entire ecosystem for all other organizations to utilize. And that data is, is instantaneously almost fed back into their individual security ecosystems so that it becomes more hardened, almost real time, um, using that cloud threat intelligence. So, and I guess being dynamic in that real time piece kind of addresses a change in state. So, for example, maybe there's a website out there, there's an e commerce website, and their normal state is acceptable, right? Um, but maybe they got attacked in some way. So, they went from a um, a known good actor to potentially a bad actor, really no, maybe no fault of their own, but they become a source point, right? So we need something to be able to dynamically change the awareness of everybody regarding that website, correct? That's correct, and and it's not uh, it, to your point. You know, obviously some of the, some websites, even some companies, right, email servers and things like that can get hijacked periodically. And, and be a source of um, sending out um, those kind of threats or that malicious activity. Um, what the, the, this threat intelligence cloud does for everybody is that as soon as that storm passes, so to speak, and things have been cleaned up, um, that same threat intelligence stays active and uh, uh, updates everyone in, in that's attached to it to the fact that the problem has been found or solved, that that particular domain has been cleared of any malicious, malicious activities. That way, people that are have been victims to it, organizations, websites, whatever, um, are not left just completely disconnected from from corporate partners and their clients. Um, it gets cleaned up, 
that threat intelligence is updated and everybody can go back to business. So when their reputation improves, they get back um, a lot back into the ecosystem. So, so that kind of tells me there's a lot of underpinning going on. There's a lot of activities that are going on. So how does this scale, right? So if you take a look at an organization who's focused on, you know, doing their business, whether it's medical or um, some sort of industrial or something along the lines, that they're going to need some help. How, how do they bring this whole picture together you know, for some sort of, you know, automation and response piece? How, how does that come together? Well, I mean, I think everybody, at least on this call, understands that um, uh, cybersecurity and information security has become a truly, you know, hot topic over the past couple of years, um, and it has just been an explosion of um, of need for security personnel, uh, of a need for organizations, um, both small business and large corporate organizations, to take a hard look at their cybersecurity. And because of just the sheer amount of these threats and these vulnerabilities that we have to deal with, right? Um, and the biggest hurdle being faced by those organizations and their security staff is the sheer volume of the, of the attacks taking place. Um, it's happened from every angle, from every possible avenue. Um, and it's completely impossible to staff enough quality security pro professionals to monitor that um, enterprise-wide 24-7, 365, right? Um, what we have in place now are systems that that pull together all of these um, points of access into the various parts of the, the, the enterprise and can pull, you know, we have constant agents that, that are watching on the desktop, on the servers, they're monitoring network traffic, and they're bringing all that threat intelligence, all that log data back into our SIM source solutions, right? Um, and then w what those things essentially do is kind of help us filter out the, the signal from the noise. It helps us understand what's truly a threat, what's truly a vulnerability, or what's just basically network chatter or system traffic that is non-threatening uh, of any kind. And once we get that information to a single uh, desktop, uh, to, a single, to a single screen, um, th those systems can then begin to take action on it, right? It can see that maybe an activity that occurred that looked very unmalicious over here in one part of your network is actually tied to three or four or five different indicators that when pulled together uh, form um, a roadmap of some kind of malicious activity, okay? And then with those systems, with human intervention, we can attach playbooks to them on how to address, remediate, and mitigate those threats from in an automated fashion. So essentially what happens yeah. is you can use those systems to take uh, a handful of very qualified security personnel and then and handle a multitude, uh, a waterfall uh, in a sense of these kind of vulnerabilities and threats. Now, so that's great. Now, you use the key word there, the, the playbook. So a lot of this uh, that we've discussed so far has really been about the technology, detecting something and adapting to it. But there's a human element to this as well, too. So if there's a breach, <clears throat> it's more than just the technology. There are other things uh, or other parts of the organization that may need to get involved. Um, it could be an HR perspective. Uh, to disseminate information within the company. Um, it could be um, from a marketing perspective where you might have to present an outside message uh, to maybe your customer base. Uh, there may be a legal aspect of it. How, how did the playbooks bring the, the, the players together to be able to uh, manage that incident? Well, in, in the fashion that we've taken on um, at GDS, what we do is that if there's a severe incident of compromise, um, or breach, or anything that the client has deemed uh, something that they take very seriously and we need to act on immediately and, and, and get handled. Uh, those playbooks and that SOAR actually sets up what's called a war room. And we, we, we work hand in hand with the client ahead of time before any major incident and discuss with them what they want to do and how they need to involve themselves in that incident and what players in their organization do they want to have involved. And essentially, this war room is a place for us to monitor real time and document the steps taken to mitigate and remediate the problem. Um, like you said, this could include HR personnel, 
This could include contacting uh, federal law enforcement to let them know about the incident of compromise. It could be uh, marketing and HR could be involved with that to fashion the statements that need to go out to the, both the, uh, the employees and the public at large. And the good thing about that is we can put all those, those players, those leaders in that room and, and connect and, and, and communicate and make sure everybody's up to speed. You can uh, provide a methodical and logical step through process of handling that problem and, and, and mitigating it as quickly as possible with the least amount of damage to the organization as we can possibly. Well, good. So we've talked about quite a few things around technology and we kind of going um, how, how we built our, our, our storyline up to this point. It's really about connectivity, bringing all the locations together for uptime and application availability. We have the visibility that was brought into it and from that visibility, we can make business decisions. We can even uh, protect ourselves. But going beyond the, the technology aspects of it, there's some back office challenges that generally need to be addressed, right? So we have, you know, organizations that are across different regions, right? Uh, it might be across the Southeast United States. You might be, you know, um, across the entire United States. And what we find in these different scenarios is um, a, a lack of, a, um, I'd say, a common provider. So um, you, you might pick a provider and they cover 22 of the states, but maybe not all of your locations. So as you subscribe to connectivity services from these organizations, what we tend to see in the back office is an, um, a, a, an increase in back office activities, um, things along the lines of multiple invoices that are needed to come in. Um, how do we take those invoices and assign them to a particular service that's assigned to a particular business unit? Uh, we've got multiple contracts and across multiple vendors to be able to manage. Typically, none of them are coterminous, you know, so there's, there's that particular um, cycle uh, challenge right there. And then one of the things that we see quite often is um, services that are being paid for on a monthly basis that are essentially retired in place. They no longer support a business application. Uh, something changed along the way. Um, you know, the IT department went a particular direction. The business office didn't know that yet. So they're continuing to pay for a service that uh, organization is really not using. So those are some of the challenges that we see popping up. Probably one of the bigger ones is it's difficult to audit, okay? And I'm going to take audits and I'm going to kind of break them into two different categories. One from a, a we'll call it, a, am I using the service kind of off, you know, audit, right? Um, what circuits do we have at which locations, which business functions do they support, um, which uh, business codes they might be mapped to within uh, customers' um, um, accounts payable type system and stuff like that. And then the other type of audit is what's going across the network and what is your organization uh, needing to um, protect themselves or provide visibility? Uh, for example, are you healthcare? Um, do you have HIPAA compliance you know, type um, uh, requirements? Are, um, are you uh, some retail or any type of point of sale that might have uh, Payment Card Institute PCI compliance? So those are different types of audits that can occur that the information from the network can turn around and be used to be able to help satisfy those requirements. So when we take a look at some of those solutions, one of the biggest solutions that we see is um, um, <clears throat> a simple, easy to understand invoice. So if you take a look at how an organization would normally put this together, you know, buy hardware from one location or from one vendor, uh, they may have the SD-WAN, they may not have, you might have to have a software overlay on top of that one. You might have multiple vendors between the MPLS circuits, the internet circuits, the LTE circuits and things along those lines. So bringing all of those into a simple, easy to read, uh, easy to understand invoice is critical to the back office um, billing operations because you could have solved the problem on the operational side of it by providing uptime and availability but you might have actually created a problem in the back office where you can't even track this or, or send it back to the right uh, business or department codes and stuff like that. So actually having that simple, easy to understand invoice is, is pretty critical. Um, and in some use cases, you can actually have uh, a customized electronic billing available so that you can um, take the um, your, your business codes, you know, uh, your GL codes, whatever, however you, you define those, and map those into the products and services that you're acquiring 
so that as you ingest those uh, bills electronically into your accounts payable system, it eases the back office, uh, back office requirements. Uh, we've seen uh, instances where uh, we've been able to reduce that manual labor from you know two or three full-time equivalents to be able to do that work and get those individuals away from that administrative task and go work on more important things for, for the company, uh, data analytics, projections, uh, growth strategies. So it gives us the, um, the ability for, for users to be able to take their employees and do something um, more beneficial for them. Um, also in this particular area, uh, and I mentioned the PCI compliance and the HIPAA compliance, so all those events that Tracy was talking about earlier, um, all the segmentation that you might need between your point of sales and your normal users, any traffic that might cross boundaries that shouldn't go across, we actually have the ability to pull that information that has been collected and submit, um, say, PCI compliance reports so it doesn't have to be an afterthought anymore. It doesn't have to be this huge exercise in going to figure out what happened over the last six months. You take the information that the network was able to see over that particular period of time and produce a report for it and hand that off to your, your compliance department as well too. So that's kind of a, you know, the big picture is one of the last challenges that we had right there. So uh, I want to take opportunity just you know, you know, kind of recap just a little bit. So the things that we really wanted to talk about, you know, the first and foremost is we wanted to protect the business operations. So we see applications being moved to corporate offices. We see those applications being put in data centers. So they're kind of decoupled or moved away from the end user. So uh, we, we must first and foremost provide availability for those applications. So network uptime is extremely important, but also equally important with that is it's got to be secure connectivity. So having the visibility into what's going across the network, how that network uh, supports uh, the, the business operations, what's permitted, what is not permitted, and then going into the security piece, um, what is malicious, right? And I'll, I'll kind of you know, take a look at uh, one, one additional step on, on the security piece. I look at it this way. We have some malicious payload. I'm going to look at it. Is, is it disruptive or is it destructive? And that's going to kind of go paint a picture of how you respond or how quickly you respond. So if something that is disruptive to your network, it might not be stopping your business, it might be kind of inconvenient. You don't have to do a complete shutdown and inoculate or isolate yourself. However, if something is destructive, that it's, it's, it's a ransomware versus just a normal run-of-the-mill malware, you'll probably want to take more appropriate steps or more immediate steps to isolate and quarantine them. So kind of wanted to bring that up, but you, you cannot do that without having some visibility. So one level you might say, okay, I have some malware, but actually to have the intelligence, you know, that says not only is it malware, but it's a specific type of malware that's ransomware and lets you, um, gives you the ability to respond, um, or respond appropriately. And of course, let, let's not, um, uh, ignore the, the back office systems. You know, how do we take that technology? How do we utilize it to increase our application, our um, uh, availability, and our uptime to support our business operations? But let's not um, put a workload on our back office systems that defeat the purpose of what we're trying to accomplish. So we're going to kind of go into a Q&A session right now, um, which you should see on your uh, right panel there is the ability to drop some questions or any questions you drop in there, we can kind of see and we can, um, we can address those. And uh, while we're waiting for some of those to come in, Tracy, I'm going to maybe uh, ask you uh, to elaborate just maybe a little bit more. Um, so we talked about uh, just recently, I was talking about the, um, uh, I guess something that is disruptive versus destructive. So having an, um, an incident response plan for those um, is kind of also helpful. So uh, can you talk about a little bit uh, some of the incident response plans? How, how do we respond to those events? You, you, you talked about the, the SOAR and stuff like those are technical pieces, but from a uh, procedural perspective, you know, what does an incident response plan look like? Well, the the I guess you consider the framework for a, a good incident response is is first identifying um, uh, the threat itself um, and w what uh, impact it's having on that environment, um, uh, and then beginning to methodically go through that environment, putting tools in place to uh, find 
um, and either eradicate or remediate those problems, right? Um, uh, from a from a end-to-end -end point of view, um, the most critical part of any incident response is uh, ensuring that you find and and eradicate um, whatever this malicious activity was, and then uh, you know hopefully, uh, with, if the client has adequately encrypted backups, um, then pulling out those backups and beginning to recover from the event. Um, okay. You know, well, more often than not, the the, the the thing that concerns me the most, and I think the thing that um, most organizations could should take into the highest consideration is, you know, leveraging um, the right kind of security products and, of course, the right kind of backups so that, you know, they can recover from an incident like that as quickly as possible and get back into a productive state. So I've got a couple of questions coming in. So first question was, um, do you route all traffic through the SD-WAN and a VPN from the remote sites um, and users? So <clears throat> I'm going to say, um, and for most engineer you talk to, they're going to say, well, it depends. And really, it's going to depend upon the business objectives. So there's a couple of things we have to take a look at, right? So first and foremost, we want secure, segmented um, communication. So if we have the ability to, um, we'll call it a split tunnel, send certain traffic up to headquarters, but other traffic up to a cloud provider, and if we, so we're splitting, it doesn't have to stay in the VPN, but I would also state that we have to have maintained visibility no matter which path it took. So if it left the location um, and it did not go in the VPN, it's not a bad thing, right? It'll go out to the internet, it'll traverse the internet, and it'll get to a location, uh, a destination location. Now, along the way, you have to evaluate that path. So if that path is actually an encrypted path using uh, TLS, SSL, you know, some encryption technologies along the way to ensure the privacy of that. And then, of course, ensuring the confidentiality using correct, you know, security certificates and things along those lines. And also have visibility at the, the far point. You absolutely can take traffic and split it up. Uh, sitting down with a you know technology consultant on how to architect your you know, architect your organization is really key into that one. So it, it's not a one size fits all. Um, second question that came in was uh, uh, it's actually kind of open ended. Is uh, can you tell us a story about when things go wrong? Um, so yes, there, there's you know there, there's plenty of evidence out there. Um, uh, probably things you. you may already have um, have seen in the news and stuff. Uh, uh, one of the common ones that most people recognize was the, the target attack. It was one, I want to say it was probably about four or five years, but it, it still resonates. It was a, it was a big one. Um, the, uh, the issue is credit cards that were stolen from, from target. Uh, the interesting thing is the point of sale systems where the data was actually stolen was not the original attack vector. So Tracy talked about attack vectors earlier, you know, being the endpoints or an internet connection and stuff like that. In this particular case, the attack point was the um, the HVAC systems, the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, because they're they're network controlled now, and it was considered a low priority system, didn't have the appropriate security on it, and that was the first penetration. That was the first attack vector, the penetration point, and from there. Uh, the bad actors use that uh, entry point to be able to, you know, hop their way through the network to get to the actually point of sale systems. So the things that we, we mentioned earlier, um, I mentioned uh, segmentation, you know, when we're talking about PCI compliance, right? How does your point of sale systems, uh, how's their traffic and the management for those systems separated from the normal user traffic? So having the correct architecture that splits up that, that traffic workload and keeps them segmented and private is extremely important. So uh, the next question, as businesses move on, excuse me, as move toward uh, software as a service platform, as a service solutions, what approach would be taken to ensure that unmanaged devices are not used to connect to these services? For example, how do we protect ourselves against a user going to the public library, connecting to salesforce.com and downloading sensitive data especially if you are using split tunneling 
in your remote location? So that was a big question. So let's kind of break it out into some smaller pieces. So first and foremost, let's just address how to connect to salesforce.com no matter where you locate it, right? So first and foremost, uh, most that, that connectivity, that connection to salesforce.com needs to be an authenticated and encrypted uh, connection. So um, we have to make sure that the, the users and the security certificates on the servers are all, you know, um, um, we'll call them rooted, you know, trusted by a particular root source that's used to identify those users to make sure that when you're truly going to salesforce.com, someone hasn't hijacked your connection and sent you off to their own version of salesforce.com. It would fail that particular test of with the authenticity of salesforce.com and it would stop that connection. So having that proper architecture at the beginning to make sure that the client is really going where they think they're going, that, that's the first key step there. Now, once you get to that location, now it's Salesforce's responsibility to verify you as a user to make sure that you are who you say you are. So we take a look at, you know, typical usernames and passwords, but that's really only one level of, of um, defense, you know, because passwords can be compromised. So what we want to look at at this point is take a look at multi-factor authentication. So it's not necessarily, you know, um, who I am, you know, I'm, I'm Robert G., um, um, what do I know, which would be my password, but let's add something else into the mix. What do I have? It could be a one-time password, it could be biometrics or something that changes on a, a repetitive basis that a typical hacker would not have. So what we've done is we've secured the, the first path is, are we sure that we're going to salesforce.com? The second path is, has Salesforce been able to identify us as an individual user? Now, the, the old thing is how do we make sure that the session stays private, right? So that's, that's the next thing. So how do we make sure that the that session stays private, no one hijacks my data, no one changes my data in process? And that's where the application layer or at the network layer, we're encrypting the data to make sure that it stays private and secure and segmented and it goes from location one to location two. So, so that was kind of a, a, a big question. I was hoping I was able to address all the different aspects of that. So, let's see. Um, I'm trying to make sure I hit all the Q and A's that were out there. I don't have any more questions coming in. So I'll kind of take this moment to uh, thank everybody for, uh, for their participation. Um, uh, we really uh, appreciate your time this morning. We tried to keep it less than 55 minutes. I'm at 53, so we're, we're doing good. Uh, metric checked on that one. Um, what we want to do is make sure that you have the ability to uh, follow up to answer any additional questions that you have. So uh, you can reach out to your account manager. You can reach out to the, uh, the numbers that are on the screen right here. We always want to take a look at the ability to help. Uh, transition or translate your business requirements to the technical requirements to be able to address those needs. Um, again, for um, for those of you who are looking forward to it, this presentation will be uh, sent out. They'll be put up on the websites and so forth uh, to be able to download and review these later. Uh, there will be a survey that is going to be coming out, and I think Jamie mentioned there's a little gift card for all the surveys that are coming in. Um, and if nothing else, I uh, thank everyone for their time. You'll have a great day. And more importantly, make sure you stay safe, not just against computer viruses, but other viruses as well. Thank you, everyone.